Hello Paul Pounds, thank you for joining me. So this video is part one of a two-part series. Is two parts a series? I don't know. About William Hope Hodgson. One of my... Uh, uh, Favourite isn't strong enough. A, a, an author that I admire and genuinely love his work. This first video is more biographical. I didn't want to make a video that was one video that was super long with everything in. So this video is going to look at his life and the second video is going to look at in depth at his weird fiction. I wanted to give myself plenty of time to talk about his work. On the 18th of April, 1918, a lieutenant and a signaller from the 171st Battery Royal Field Artillery were sent on a forward reconnaissance mission um, to Mount Kemmel in Belgium. They reported in on the 19th of April. Then everything went silent. On the 20th of April, their commanding officer, having not heard from them, made the unusual decision to actually go to where they made their last report from, see if he could find them. He didn't find the lieutenant and the signaller, but he did find a French officer who, after a, a brief conversation, showed him a battered helmet which bore the name Lieutenant W. Hope Hodgson. He reported that Lieutenant Hodgson had been killed in a German artillery blast as had the signaller. And there wasn't a lot of them physically left after the explosion. So they were buried by the French soldiers at the foot of Mount Kemmel. The death was officially entered on the 23rd of April. Lieutenant Hodgson was 40 years old and once again the commanding officer took another unusual step he wired Lieutenant Hodgson's mother directly with a personal message. I cannot express my deep sympathy for you in your great bereavement. I feel it most terribly myself and so do all the other officers and men of the battery. He was the life and soul of the mess, always so willing and cheery. Of his courage I can give no praise that is high enough. He was always volunteering for any dangerous duty. And it was owing to his entire lack of fear that he probably met his death on April the 17th. He'd performed wonders of gallantry only a few days before, and it's a miracle that he survived that day. I myself am deeply grieved, having lost a real, true friend and a splendid officer. So who was this chap? What made him? What endeared him to his commanding officer and the other men that he fought alongside? He was, of course, William Hope Hodgson, one of the greatest writers of weird fiction, in my opinion, that has ever lived. William Hope Hodgson was born on the 1st of November, 
his family used the name Hope more than William. William was, uh, he was named after his grandfather, William Hodgson. His parents were Samuel and Lizzie Sarah Hodgson, formerly Brown. And his dad was uh, an Anglican priest. Now, his dad moved around a lot from diocese to diocese um, for a few reasons, partly because of his religious aggression. Uh, he was a, a fire and brimstone type of chap. Partly because... Samuel hated Catholics with a fervent vigour to the point where groups of Catholics would turn up at his residence and try and assault him and issue threats against him and his family. William Hope Hodgson was one of 12 siblings. So it was a big family. And the ire that Samuel provoked in members of other faiths, uh, it, it was genuinely cause for concern. Three of Hodgson's siblings did die when they were very young. And this is something that will return in uh, Hodgson's fiction. Now, Hodgson was no stranger as a child to running away. And I'm guessing the the cocktail of his father's religious fervour and parenting techniques of that time which were very violent made, made Hodgson want to escape. He kind of escaped a little bit when he went to boarding school. Now there's a couple of different um, accounts of uh, what actually happened at this point. So some people state that William Hope Hodgson ran away from boarding school because he hated it to essentially join the Merchant Navy. And some sources say while he was at boarding school, his father passed away, and they could uh, the family could no longer continue to pay the fees for the boarding school. So William Hope Hodgson decided to find a way of making money, so he could send some back to his mother to support his many siblings. Either way, he definitely signed up. For a life at sea. He was 14 at this point and uh, he lied about his age to to get signed on. Um, he was he was apprentice for Mr W. W. Nelson who worked for the Shaw and Savile Shipping Company. Now this is just the start of William Hope Hodgson's amazing and strange and thrilling life. So he qualified as an, uh, as an officer in 1895 and he wasn't just uh, an experienced sailor. He was uh, an enthusiastic photographer, something which was still in its infancy and documented a lot of aspects of life on board ship through his photographs. He became a avid fitness enthusiast, but not just like diet and exercise fitness enthusiast. In some fact in the case of William Hope Hodgson, an essay by Alan Everts, 
He quotes one of William Hope Hodgson's friends who's speaking about a pivotal moment um, of Hodgson's life at sea. When one day he saw the first mate knock down one of the crew, Hodgson, then senior apprentice, made up his mind that no man should do that to him without getting as good as he gave. From that time onward he started training and not only trained himself to become a first-rate boxer but fired all of his junior apprentices to follow suit so that the whole crowd were conspicuous for their physique and splendid general health. To a landsman this may sound an easy thing to do but to a sailor man it means much. It means the sacrifice of much that makes life bearable on board. But it wasn't just other apprentices that received brutal treatment at the hands of some of the mates. In an interview in the Blackburn Times, William Hope Hodgson recalls, Being a little chap with a very ordinary physique, I had the misfortune to serve under a second mate of the worst possible type. He was brutal, and although I can truthfully say I never gave him just cause, he singled me out for ill treatment. He made my life so miserable that in the end I summoned up sufficient courage to retaliate and went for him. It was for all the world like a fight between a mastiff and a terrier, for he was powerful and knew how to punish. Of course, I took a merciless thrashing. Hodgson was a charming, charismatic, entertaining chap, and it led to many of his peers becoming incredibly fond of him aboard ship. But it wasn't just his personality. He had the courage of his convictions to back it up. He had, like, genuine bravery. It was on the evening of the 28th of March, 1898, that an unnamed seaman fell overboard just off the coast of New Zealand, near Port Chambers. Despite there being strong currents, it wasn't a smooth, glassy-surfaced sea that day. And despite sharks being sighted in the water, William Hope Hodgson plunged into the water after the seaman. He rescued him. He swam to him, got him, and clung to a boy and the seaman for 25 minutes, surrounded by sharks in unpleasant waters until a boat came to rescue them both. For this, he was awarded a medal by the Royal Humane Society. In 1899, William Hope Hodgson left his life at sea behind him, once and for all. He'd saved lives, he'd been round the world three times. He'd lived that adventure and was looking for something new. William Hodgson, Hope's granddad, died in 1900. And he left the family a modest but sizeable inheritance. And William Hope Hodgson used this money to open his school of physical culture where he could provide an environment where people could physically better themselves. At this point in his life, Hope Hodgson's life seems to be fitness and fun. Fitness was everything to him, but also he liked pranks, strange pranks, like next level pranks. He would often scale the sides of buildings to get to upper levels on the outside to appear at somebody's window to terrify them. He tried to make his own fireworks and ended up, whilst drying out the chemical compounds, ended up blowing up his oven. Just make explosive fireworks in your oven mate 
he made a box kite, a huge box kite, to which could be attached a chair. Because he wanted to try and fly his brother, Chad. <laughs> Ultimately, the kite didn't provide enough lift to raise Chad off the ground. They did manage to fly the chair, but not Chad in it. In late August of 1902, William Hope Hodgson would do one of his many infamous stunts. He, he wasn't an entertainer like an actual entertainer on stage, but he obviously liked to entertain people with examples of his physical prowess or later on in his life with his staggering fiction. So in 1885, we're going back a little bit, a chap called Will Robertson had cycled down the steps of the Capitol building in Washington. And he'd received huge acclaim for this. And people thought he was going to have a fall and perish horribly or land mangled at the bottom. And this chap, this Will Robertson, made it down the steps. And nobody, nobody ever repeated this. The newspapers at the time suggested it would start a trend and people would try and do it faster or with no hands or on crazy bikes. But nobody managed to cycle down the steps of the Capitol building again. They might have done it in recent times, but back then nobody had done it. And this, this inspired William Hope Hodgson. And when a large causeway was, was built in Blackburn, where Hope Hodgson currently lived, he decided he was going to do his own version of it. There was an article about this endeavour in a local newspaper, and a lot of people think this article was actually penned by Hodgson just to big himself up, bless him. During the summer months, workmen have been busily engaged in improving the means of access to Revage by the conversion of that old time lover's lane, known to some as the Ginnel, to others as the Snicket, in more recent times as Spin Cop, into a modern road to be known henceforth as Brantfell Road. According to some authorities, the town has one, maybe two, hillside streets, steeper than this one even. But the official mind holds a contrary view, for it has ruled the Snicket, etc., too steep for ordinary treatment, and has turned it into a street of steps, the only one that Blackburn is able to boast. Now the old narrow limb-twisting lane, lying at the bottom of a couple of ugly walls, has been replaced by a wide road, on which a series of steps has been laid. The steps numbering 60 in all, each about a couple of feet in width. On the red rake side, a handsome wall to be surmounted by iron railings has been built. And as a protection to unwary drivers who might mistake the street for one of the common or garden variety, five iron posts have been implanted. Don't know why? Perhaps it's to keep the flies off. Now, although a cart or carriage may not be squeezed between the posts, there's nothing on earth to prevent a bicycle being pedalled through. Prudence would, of course, dictate a very wide detour in preference to a short cut down the steps, and 99 men out of 100 would vote such a ride a flat impossibility. There are some men, however, to whom fear is an unknown quantity and danger merely an element to be conquered. And one of these is Mr W. H. Hodgson, the well-known professor of physical culture, who has this week cycled down the steppy precipice without breaking his neck. 
It was on Tuesday afternoon and the workmen engaged in putting the finishing touches to the new thoroughfare were hard at work when Mr Hodgson appeared on the scene and electrified them by dropping his well-braked freewheel over the top step. Breathlessly, one and all watched him as he calmly hopped from ledge to ledge, every bound full of dire possibility. Second followed second. The snap, the slip, the crash, fearfully looked for, failed to come. Mr Hodgson's guardian angel was on duty that day, and only a few more steps remained to be negotiated. At this point, a touch of comedy was thrown into the scene. Among the watchers was a good lady resident of the street, and just before the rider reached her dwelling, she rushed out of a garden gate and with outstretched arms barred the path, exclaiming, Here, this isn't for carts and bicycles. Her motive was no doubt good, but little did she realise how she was adding to the peril of the situation. Happily, Mr Hodgson had his machine so completely under control that most wonderful part of his performance, he had no difficulty in throwing himself from the saddle and landing him on his feet. This was on the 58th step, and having safely navigated the steps thus far, Mr Hodgson, determined not to be beaten, managed to mount again and proceed on his way, rejoicing. On the 24th of October that very same year, William Hope Hodgson met... Harry Houdini. Houdini was doing a tour of local theatres and did a, a run at Blackburn, at one of the theatres in Blackburn. And famously, Houdini stayed at the local police station. He was locked up every afternoon and would escape from the police station in time to get to the theatre and perform his miraculous feats of escapology. This irked the local police a little bit, and they weren't happy about it. So when William Hope Hodgson asked the local police if they could help him and lend him some handcuffs, they were more than happy to oblige. You see, Houdini had this challenge to anybody in the audience. If you could contain him, if you could lock him up in a way, just with, you know, handcuffs and chains and padlocks, if you could lock him up in a way that he couldn't escape from, you would win £25, which at the time was probably well worth having. On the last night of the run at Blackburn, Houdini issued the challenge proudly to anybody in the audience that wanted to try and restrain him. William Hope Hodgson jumped at the chance and was there. Put the manacles on Houdini. Houdini would go on to complain that they were far too tight and the locks were jammed up. But Hodgson got the handcuffs on Houdini and the audience held its breath. After an hour, Houdini claimed he couldn't get out of them and asked William Hope Hodgson to come and release him. A, a doctor stand by, Houdini always had uh, a medical, you know, medical assistance while he was doing any of his dangerous feats. The doctor came and examined his wrists while the handcuffs were still on him and confirmed that Houdini was losing circulation and the handcuffs could damage Houdini's wrists permanently if they weren't removed. But William Hope Hodgson <laughs> politely declined, having the only key and the only means of releasing the handcuffs. It took Houdini two hours to get out of the handcuffs, which is the longest time anybody has managed to restrain him for it, during his illustrious and staggering career. Straight after Houdini's rather uh, laboured escape, 
William Hope Hodgson fled the theatre, fearing repercussions from disgruntled audience members who might have thought his actions weren't particularly fitting of a British gentleman. Houdini would complain and go on to write in his diaries that were published after his death, saying that the handcuffs were non-regulation. And he also says, I have been in the handcuff business for 14 years, but never have I been so brutally and cruelly ill-treated. Those locks were plugged. He also goes on to uh, mention Blackburn. Of all the hoodlum towns I have ever worked, Blackburn is certainly the worst. He did return to Blackburn uh, for a second stint at a different theatre and William Hope Hodgson decided not to attend those shows. In 1903, William Hope Hodgson started his writing career in earnest, starting with articles, just articles on fitness photography, um, which again, like I said, was a developing art form. No pun intended, genuinely. <laughs> and uh, he wrote exposés about his life at sea, which was illustrated by some of the amazing photographs he'd taken while he was working on the ships. His first story, The Goddess of Death, was published in 1904 by the Royal Magazine. But we're not going to get into his fiction in this video, like I said. That's going to be for part two. So let's skip forward a little bit. William Hope Hodgson had been working as a writer and in 1911 he met uh, and married Betty Farnworth. She was a columnist and writer for the popular Home Notes magazine. At the outbreak of the First World War, William Hope Hodgson volunteered for active service. He was considered to be too old to be conscripted. It was suggested that he should join the Navy given his illustrious past on ships but he didn't want to go back to sea, not for any reason. And it's quite sad because if he'd taken a post in the Navy, there was a better chance of him surviving to the end of the First World War. In 1916, whilst on active service, he was thrown from a horse and suffered quite severe injuries to his head and jaw. He was discharged from the military and not expected to return to active service given the nature and severity of his injuries. But this is William Hope Hodgson. And don't forget, shark-infested waters, Harry Houdini, even a large amount of steps couldn't stop William Hope Hodgson and injuries from this fall wouldn't stop him either. He showed his trademark grit and physical determination and working so incredibly hard got his health back to a level where he could be considered for active service again and demanded that he be sent back to the front. I'm quite interested in the First World War and have read and seen a lot about it. My great uncle was in an exhibition, was featured in an exhibition at the Imperial War Museum about soldiers that went over the top on the first day of the Somme. And I can't imagine the determination you would need to, to get your health and well-being back to a level 
where you first off were fit enough to go back and second off were determined to go back to what was for a lot gen so many young men an absolute living hell I don't I I was going to say I don't think I could have done it but it's not even a think it was an amazing thing to do on his return to the trenches he wrote to his mother the sun was pretty low as I came back and far off across that desolation here and there they showed just formless squarish cornerless masses erected by man against the infernal storm that sweeps forever night and day day and night across that most atrocious plain of destruction my god talk about a lost world talk about the end of the world talk about the nightland it's all here not more than 200 miles off from where you sit infinitely remote and the infinite monstrous dreadful pathos of the things one sees the great shell hole with over 30 crosses sticking in it some just up out of the water and the dead below them submerged if i live and come out of this and certainly please god i shall hope to what a book i shall write if my old ability with the pen has not forsaken me what a book he would have written having experienced the horrors and the total destruction of millions and millions of young men and women in that war shortly after writing this letter he would be sent on a forward reconnaissance mission to Mount Kemmel thank you for watching guys um, and as you can guess by the length of this video I didn't want to start getting into breaking down William Hope Hodgson's fiction so that will happen next week and it'll be a bit more cheerful than this video so thank you for joining me I appreciate the time that you've spent hearing me ramble about largely forgotten authors and i will see you lovely and wonderful and enthusiastic pulp hounds in the next video <laughs>